Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. Today I'll be continuing on with Chapter 9 of If We're Being Honest. This chapter is entitled Bakugo, Part 2. Kotsky couldn't believe what he had just done. The one thing. The one goddamn thing. The one thing that he had tried to keep a secret with this quirk from hell over him. The only thing that he knew that he couldn't come back from. The one thing he swore to take to his grave. They all knew about it now. He was going to scream. Scratch that, he was definitely screaming. He found himself in the middle of the woods on his knees, where he knew for a fact they weren't patrolling at the moment, because when he had nightmares he came out here and ran until he felt like death and had memorized the patrol schedules as a result. He was all alone with these stupid trees and therefore didn't bother stopping the raw, guttural shrieks that ripped from his throat. Of course you fucked it up, brat. No one will ever love you when they realize how much of a villain you really are. He kindly told his mother's voice to go fuck off in his head. Would they think of him as a villain now, some traitorous part of his brain wandered? Would they think that when they realized he was so horrible that even his own parents couldn't stand the sight of him? After all, they already thought that he got off too easy for what he had done, he thought bitterly. That's how most people saw villains that walked free. He let out a few more screams and slammed his fists into the ground for good measure. He screamed until he felt like he had been eating glass and then screamed some more. How could he have been so stupid? He was so fucking close, too. Not even another week, and he would have been home free. And he had lasted this long. It was only because fucking pink cheeks, of all people, had made him feel so angry. And yes, I know that doing bad things means bad things happen. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Because nothing ever worked out for him. Not really. He gets a super cool quirk, and everyone at school loves him. Suddenly he's the brat that doesn't know his own weaknesses anymore, and he needs to be reminded. He wins the sports festival. He says no to the award because he doesn't think he's earned it, and they restrain him like a fucking dog and force him into a panic attack in front of millions. He gets an internship offer with Best Genist. The hero only wants to change every single thing about him. He goes to a fucking summer camp, of all things. The League of Villains decides he's their newest recruit. And that was it, wasn't it? He was always going to be seen as a villain. His mother reminded him of that all the time. She was worse than most accenting her words with a well-aimed punch or kick that it's just anything and everything that she could get her hands on. He should have, damn it, he should have been able to not say anything. He had been doing that his whole fucking life. It was why this truth quirk was so easy to handle. He had already had the urge to spill everything to everyone all the time. Please help me, he had been saying with his eyes ever since elementary. The anger only seemed to mask his fear, because he was terrified of anyone finding out, yet Somehow he still desperately wanted someone to know, and take him away from it all. Please, help me. Save me. Save me, since he was too fucking weak to save himself. A horrible sinking feeling began to take hold in his chest. They were going to want to ask him questions. Why were you so weak, Kotsky? Why couldn't you get away, Kotsky? Why did you let her do that to you, Kotsky? Didn't you deserve that, Kachan? Fuck, he'd deal with that later. For now, he just kept on screaming. Kirishima watched disconnectedly as Uraraka stuttered and she was in shock. I didn't mean, she was saying, trembling like a leaf as she began to cling to Midoriya for dear life. I didn't mean to. Kirishima had to focus on her, because the alternatives were going to eat him alive. There was something in his chest that was weighing him down, and a definite lump in his throat that he was going to ignore. He felt like ripping his own skin off, anything to rid him of this feeling that was taking root in him and crawling all over his flesh. It felt a lot like horror, but he knew that wasn't quite it. He vaguely noticed how completely petrified and devastated everyone else looked, but made no move to comfort them like he normally would, because he just couldn't move. He wasn't sure how Kotsky had kept that secret for so long under the truth quirk, but it didn't matter anymore. It was out, and now he was gone, and the one person that might have been able to make Kirishima feel better was suffering, and he couldn't do a single thing about it. He didn't know where on earth he was, or if he would be coming back at all. And it hurt. Did you... He heard himself croak in Midoriya's general direction. Did you know? He found himself staring into eyes that were so full of sorrow that he almost took a step back. Somehow he knew that Midoriya saw the exact same thing reflecting back at him in his own way. No. He was rubbing Uraraka's back, but almost in a way that made it seem like he was comforting himself more than her. I... I never knew. How can I? 
He suddenly choked on a sob and the tears began to rush down his face. He looked completely and wholeheartedly broken. How could I not have known? How did I miss it? Oh, God, it's so obvious now. Hey. Todoroki took one of his hands that was still wrapped around Uraraka. His voice sounded strained and Kirishima tried not to think about why. You can't blame yourself for this. Kirishima stopped paying attention after all that. He couldn't help it. His thoughts were too much for him to handle on his own. Much less with a whole other heartbreaking conversation on top of it all. He must have fallen to the floor because his knees suddenly slammed into something hard. His legs couldn't hold his own weight anymore. He realized as he fell back on his ankles. He put his head in his hands and he did his best not to shake. It didn't really work because when he looked at his hands they were trembling so bad that he knew he wouldn't have been able to hold on to a feather if he tried. Kotsky didn't show up for breakfast the next morning, and Kirishima wasn't surprised in the slightest. He had heard him come back to the dorms in the dead of night, hearing the door next to his open so late it was almost light outside, before it closed far softer than it ever had before. Kirishima hadn't gotten a single ounce of sleep, and he doubted either of them would any time soon. The only reason he'd gone back to his dorm at all was because the rest of the squad had physically forced him to. He had wanted to stay there until sunrise, but they tried to convince him that he needed at least some sleep, and that Kotsky probably wouldn't even talk to him if he tried. They finally convinced him around two in the morning when the blonde was still nowhere to be seen. He didn't comment on the fact that none of them looked like they had gotten any sleep either. Everyone looked like zombies. Not a single smile could be seen, and it was almost dead silent. He avoided looking at his friends, and he didn't want to too much because he knew how close he was to losing it. And then he saw Uraraka, shakily eating cereal at the table and he lost it in a completely different way. He wasn't sure why he did it. He wasn't sure what made him so rationally angry. Maybe it was rational, and he was completely in the right to say the things that he did. He just saw the girl that stared and started it all, and his blood boiled below his skin, and his vision turned crimson. Maybe this was how Kotsky felt all the time, with the extra adrenaline pumping through his system. If so, he deserved a lot more credit. He wasn't sure of what he said, or how he said it, or... How long it took, but by the end of it, Uraraka was crying, and he felt so overwhelmed with guilt and regret that he almost ran off just like Kotsky had the night before. But he didn't, if only because they would see each other in about twenty minutes when class began anyway. "'I'm so sorry,' he said, instead trying not to cry himself as he practically fell into a chair. "'It's not you that I'm mad at. I mean, I am. That was a really shitty thing to do. But, like, it's not you. I just want to... to... To wrap him in a hug and set his parents on fire, Midoriya asked with an emotional, tear-filled laugh. Yeah, he said, lips quirking up shakily. That. I'm sorry, too, Uraraka said, wiping out her eyes. I shouldn't have pushed him. I shouldn't have said those things. I shouldn't have said that he didn't know what consequences were. She suddenly froze, like ice had been poured down her shirt, almost jerking to a stop. She was silent for a moment before putting her head in her hands. Oh, God. What? Kirishima asked desperately, feeling his heart begin to pound beneath his ribcage. She looked like she had seen a ghost, and, with the way things were going, he almost didn't want to know, whatever she realized. "'Remember? Remember when I slapped him?' she said, breath hitching. "'I didn't even realize. He just—just just shut down, didn't he?' He was right. He didn't want to know. She just broke all over again, tears falling into her breakfast like some messed-up seasoning. Kirishima followed not long after. Midori was right. This quirk was messing with him so bad. At least, that's what he told himself. Kirishima was about five seconds from putting his head on his desk and never picking it back up when Aizawa asked where Kotsky was. He must have seen their distraught looks, their tear-strained faces, and yet he still asked because attendance records trumped their feelings. He couldn't have known. He didn't look like the world was ending, and Kotsky had said that they stopped their counseling sessions because of the truth quirk, and Kirishima now realized it was because he didn't want Aizawa to find out. He bit his lip. He couldn't say anything. It wasn't his right to say anything. Kotsky had never wanted anyone to know. Had never wanted for any of this to happen. Kirishima could feel the raw, fucking willpower of the class was all using when nobody answered his question, either. Kotsky must have been there in spirit or something. They all knew they couldn't say anything. They had no right to, truth quirk or not, and yet he knew they were all desperately wanting to. He's not coming, Midoriya finally said, voice low and dangerous and close to tears all at once. 
He probably won't for a while. Aizawa simply nodded and started the class. Part of Kirishima wanted to scream at him until his throat turned raw. He's not okay. He's never been okay. Go and do something about it. Don't just sit there. How could he just sit in this classroom like nothing was wrong? How could he not immediately go find him and help him? How could he just walk by his dorm room that morning and not go inside, knocking for only a few minutes just to be answered with nothing? Why didn't he break the door down and make sure he was okay? Maybe he was actually mad at himself. Kotsky didn't show up until a few days later, at the end of the week. They hadn't seen him at all. He didn't come down to eat until all of them were either in sleep, or asleep or in class. Kirishima knew this because he never really slept anymore. Too busy tossing and turning and listening to Kotsky breathe through their shared wall. It was too slow. Too fast. Not close enough, but it was the only reason he knew he was still alive. He had tried reaching out to him. So many times he pounded on his door, begging him to open it and let him in. There was no response, no change, not even acknowledgement that he had been heard. He was pretty sure he heard Midoriya doing the same, fists pounding and voice pleading. The rest of their friends tried too, but were met with absolutely nothing. Jiro had even tried listening to him, simply making sure he was okay when nothing else seemed to work. And even Kotsky didn't actually show up to class. It was at the end of homeroom, when he simply burst through the door like he always did and went straight for Aizawa, with a murderous glint in his eyes. Kirishima stared at him. It was the first time he was seeing the blonde in what felt like an eternity, and, to put it lightly, he looked like a wreck. His hair was clearly unwashed and frazzled, like he had been putting on a show for who knows how long. The bags under his eyes were bigger than Shinso's. His nails were bitten down almost to the end, and his knuckles all had scabs on them. He wasn't wearing his uniform, in fact. It looked like he hadn't changed clothes since he had stormed out the other night. Kirishima was going to throw up. It's been a month, Kotsky said, slamming his hands down on the teacher's desk. Yes, it has, Aizawa said, not looking up from the papers that he was grading. So why is this fucking truth quirk still active? Aizawa sighed and turned to him, keeping his face blank. Kirishima wondered if that was deliberate. There was no way to know, but Kirishima was sure of it now. I told you at the beginning of this month that it was the least amount of time it would last, even if it was the most likely amount. The quirk specialist said it could take as long as three. You fucking liar! Well, you were the ones hit by the truth quirk, not me. I didn't see a reason to worry you all. Bakugo just let off a string of curses so long it probably broke some sort of record. He then stormed right back out the door, but not before Aizawa called out to him. And you better start showing up for class, unless you want your grades to start dropping even more. He didn't respond, walking right out and slamming the door so hard it cracked. Shoto wasn't surprised when Bakugo finally came back to class the next Monday. It wasn't like he could avoid them forever, and yes, Shoto definitely understood wanting to hide when secrets such as theirs came out, but the blonde cared too much about his grades to stay hidden away for the next two months. Theirs. The word still stuck out to him like a sore thumb. Out of all the people in their class to share trauma with, Bakugo was probably the person who would have been his last guess, which he realized was foolish in retrospect. So many of the signs were there. Irrational anger, irritability, well-hidden anxiety, difficulty connecting with peers, internalized violent tendencies, a supposed superiority complex that probably masked an inferiority complex. How close he had been to Shinso during his panic attack, and how he had grabbed his arm when the truth was finally exposed, or even, when an adult hurts you, it's not okay, no matter their fucking motivation or whatever. He shook his head. He couldn't afford to think about all this right now, or he might get emotional again, and he had had enough of that for a lifetime. He knew his classmates were no better, especially Bakugo's squad of friends. They hardly ate, hardly slept, and most of their time was now spent camped outside of Bakugo's room. It wasn't even always to try and talk to him. Shoto had once walked by to see them all sitting around the door late at night, not saying a word, almost as if they were afraid something would happen if they strayed too far. Mizuku wasn't faring much better, in any way, shape, or form. As his closest friend and boyfriend, Shoto had taken the brunt of comforting Izuku through all his tears the past few days. Ida and Uraraka had helped him somewhat, but the girl was also distressed beyond belief, and Ida was trying to help her the best that he could at the same time. And it was no secret how much of a mess Kirishima was. So when Bakuka walked into class, not even thirty seconds until the bell rang, all movement and sound stopped. He didn't even look at anyone as he marched to his seat and angrily sat down. Izuku, who sat right behind him, looked like he had seen a ghost and was about to cry at the same time. He seemed to be the only one brave enough to speak, though. Hey, Kachan, 
he said with a forced light tone. Bakugo took a deep breath like he was trying to calm himself before accidentally biting the other's head off. What do you want, nerd? Oh, uh, he looked down at his desk like Bakugo had eyes in the back of his head and was mad at Izuku for just looking at him. I just wanted to see if you were okay. This would usually be where Bakugo exploded or said something like, Of course I'm fucking okay, who do you think you're talking to? Or just straight up ignore him. His voice was instead defeated as he spoke. What do you think, Deku? Izuku looked like he was really going to start crying at that, but then Aizawa walked in and class began. No one really paid attention to the lesson, though. Despite all that was happening, Shoto trusted himself to not be shaken by whatever was going to happen. He was usually a very collected person, so he wasn't worried about what could occur. He honestly felt like he was prepared for anything at this point. We're doing one-on-one -on -one quirkless sparring. Todoroki and Bakugo, you're up first. Except for that. He glanced over at the blonde, who just glared at him before sharply looking away. He was slightly off to the side of the group, and when he heard his name get called, a large scowl set itself across his face. They wordlessly walked over to the middle of the ring and got in their fighting stances. Shoto braced himself, because he knew Bakugo wasn't going to be pulling punches. He didn't on a normal day, but whenever he was mad about something, he always had that much more steam to burn. And he really had a lot to be mad about, didn't he? Aizawa told them to start, and the blonde immediately went in with a right hook, which Shoto dodged easily, but that was just the beginning. He dodged a million and one attacks in just a few minutes, the stream of punches and swings never ceasing. He wasn't sure how long it went on for, because Bakugo started suddenly glaring at him, even more intensely than he had before the start of the match. Stop holding back, Bakugo yelled as he got in close. Shoto hadn't realized it, but he was holding back, mainly sticking to dodges and other defensive moves. He went to apologize, to tell him he didn't mean it and that it, he wasn't going to make sure to give it his all now. That's just because of his past he wasn't going to treat him like some fragile piece of glass. Was it your mom or your dad? Shoto grunted between hits instead. My mom! Gosh, shut your mouth! Bakugo now looked pissed, but Shoto didn't stop for some godforsaken reason. So your dad wasn't in the picture or what? My dad never gave a shit, he spat. He was always off doing who knows what. Icy hot, I'm going to make you wish you were never born. He accented this with a large left hook that slammed into Shoto's stomach, making him sputter and cough for a moment, which gave Bakugo the chance to punch him hard enough to send him flying to the ground. I'm sorry they did that to you, he grunted out as he found his way back up into a fighting stance. Sure you are, Bakugo hissed, going for the kill again. They dodged around each other as the blonde continued to growl at him. Like you aren't happy your boyfriend's little bully got what he deserved. Of course not, he said with wide eyes, grunting as a fist hit his shoulder. Why on earth would I think that? Gee, let me think. Maybe it was you wanting to punch me ever since you found out, and now you know, so you don't have to anymore. I already know I'm a fucking villain. You don't have to spell it out for me. Bakugo, Shoto said, suddenly frozen in place, and therefore giving the other a chance to hit his gut and knock him down once more. What? Are you going to pity me too? Send me those stupid puppy dog eyes? I think I understand you more than anyone else here, Shoto managed to say as he struggled upwards. So no, I'm not going to pity you. Bakugo let out a huff that almost sounded like laughter, before going right back into his barrage of attacks. Actually, I think Mindfuck understands me better than you ever will. Shinso? Shoto asked, bewildered. I don't understand. Because at least your father liked you, he finally screamed, stomping his non-stop attacks, and looking like something had snapped deep inside of him, his shoulders heaving and eyes dangerous. Yeah, he might have been an absolute piece of shit, and you probably had it way worse than me, but at least he had half a mind to call you his goddamn masterpiece. Shoto wasn't sure what emotion was taking hold of him, but it felt a lot like dread. Bakugo. Oh, shut up, he yelled, throwing another half-hearted punch that Shoto dodged easily. My parents hate me. They've been saying I'm a villain for as long as I can remember. My mom fucking told me it was my fault that I got kidnapped and threatened to kick me out because of it. I'm pretty sure the only reason that she didn't was because of the goddamn dorms. He was practically seething at the mouth by now and staring at Shoto with an expression so full of hate that it almost masked the unrelenting pain in his eyes. How's that for understanding me? Bakugo spat when Shoto could only stand and stare at him. Do you understand everything a single person wanting to chain you up no matter where you go? Like fucking villains thinking that you're one of them, or heroes when you've only said no, or your mother with duct tape over your fucking ankles and wrists because it's cheaper than quirk suppressants. 
Shoto almost fell to the ground of his own volition this time. He must have looked like a fish out of water, because Bakugo nearly laughed, like every word he had said wasn't more of a punch to the gut than his actual hits. He then got in close, pointing a finger right in his chest. His words were quiet this time, but still sounded just as deadly. Like I said, the brainwashing bastard has more in common with me than you ever will, even if it's only because of the goddamn things shoved over our mouths. He suddenly jolted in what appeared to be fear. He then turned to everyone else, obviously playing off that he had forgotten they were there. Mind your own fucking business, extras. He then shot out of the room, leaving Shota to do nothing but truly fall to the floor. He got a weird sense of deja vu from when the hero killer finally stopped moving all those months ago. The pure horror and shock filling every inch of his system as if he couldn't move if his life depended on it. Does anyone care to explain? Aizawa said, a dark edge to his voice. None of them had ever heard before. Shoto had a feeling that they were going to be there for a while. They did have the whole period left, after all. He heard someone run to a trash can and throw up. He glanced up over and saw that it was Kirishima. There was one class left after hero training that day, and Kirishima absolutely did not want to go to it. What did he need art history for, anyway? What purpose did it serve other than to keep him from going to Kotsky? Why didn't he just run and follow him out the gym doors? Was it because he was frozen like a coward again, just like he always was? Or was it the nausea from all the things he said that caused him to spew up his lunch? Or was he just terrified of what he would find out if he did follow? But he didn't want his rapidly dropping grades to suffer even more, so he sucked it up and went to class. He knew Kotsky wouldn't have let him talk to him either way, as upset as he was to admit it. He thought that at least he deserved something, some form of acknowledgement, some form of, I still care about you? His bitter thoughts ran rampant for a few moments before he squashed them down into the dirt. Because he knew that wasn't fair. Of course it wasn't. If Kirishima wanted to cry just thinking about what Kotsky had said, he couldn't imagine how he felt every moment of every day. Seeing his unkempt form and dead eyes was heart-wrenching enough on its own, and throw the whole emotional bullshit thing that Midoriya had told them about, and a nasty picture was painted on how he must be feeling. Kotsky didn't owe anyone anything. This quirk took away his freedom to choose what to say, and it was no one's fault that the fallout was so horrendous. The words he had screamed at Todoroki kept repeating in his mind like a broken record. Over and over again, he heard the words, just like he'd been hearing his initial confession, over and over and over, like he was still screaming it right in front of his face, clear as day. He was never going to look at closets the same way ever again, that was for sure. Or duct tape. He could still taste the bile in his mouth from the aftermath of that particular truth bomb. Midnight began class as usual, just like nothing was amiss. He wanted to scream at her, too, that they shouldn't be wasting time with all this stuff when Kotsky was... when Kotsky was... Wait a fucking minute. Kirishima, what are you doing? He heard Midnight say through the fog in his brain. Oh, he was standing up. Good. You heard him. His voice was quiet, yet still so much darker than it normally was. He didn't care. You... you did that to him. I did what? She asked, clearly confused. The sports festival, he spat. You fucking muzzled him, and then chained him up. He barely registered the sharp intakes of breath from the rest of the class as they realized. He could barely hear over the blood pounding in his ears as he stared at the teacher that simply looked on impassively. I only did what was necessary, she said, unimpressed. He wasn't cooperating. Oh, fuck you. And that was Shinso, who was now on his feet. Do you even understand how wrong that was? How horrible it was to see that heroes had no problem muzzling a student for no reason? He wasn't going to accept the award, which was mandatory. So you chained him up instead, Kirishima snapped, and didn't think that his wild thrashing was some sort of goddamn panic attack? We had no reason to believe so, no. She pulled her glasses up on her face like this was just a talk about the weather. There was nothing that we could have known, no way we would have known that he could cause such a reaction. Even though the fact that he had been attacked by a villain and restrained like that was already on his record, Midori asked a haunted look in his eyes, and Kirishima remembered that he had been attacked, too. He was glaring at his desk, like, if he looked at it hard enough, it would give him the answers as to why this was all happening. Something the teachers should have been made aware of. Midnight had the decency to look slightly guilty for a moment, but then just looked annoyed. Young man? Oh, shut your mouth, Kirishima yelled. How could you do that to him? Why would... He gripped his desk hard as defeat suddenly crashed over him. Why am I just standing here? He grabbed his backpack, shakily, and began to storm out of the room. 
He ignored Midnight as she told him to stay. In fact, he only began walking faster. Pretty soon he was running. Kotsky, he yelled for pounding on the door for what felt like the millionth time. Open the door. No response. He heard him breathing through their wall, so he knew he was in there, but still nothing. He tried again, and again, and again, and again. Damn it, he finally yelled, slamming his fists against the door and leaving them there in frustration. I can't. I can't do this anymore, Katz. I, I care about you so much, and I just need... He choked on a lump in his throat and belatedly realized that he was crying. He rested his forehead on the door and watched as the tears hit the carpet. His voice came out as barely a whisper. I need to know you're okay. He didn't hear anything. His fists began to slide down the door. I need you here, okay? And I know that it's stupid, that I need you when you're the one hurting, but I just, I can't stand seeing you like this, please. Nothing. He stepped back slowly, blinking dazedly as he finally hit the wall and began to slide down, down, down. He found himself sitting, staring at the door like if he just looked at it hard enough it would open, like it would just open for him. He wasn't sure how long he sat there. He felt like he was dying, which again was ridiculous because he wasn't the one suffering, but he felt like it nonetheless. He felt like his heart was being ripped from his chest and he could do nothing to stop it. I'm sorry, he choked out eventually, still staring at the closed door. About everyone and what they were saying that night, and I just, I didn't defend you, and I was just, I was scared and, and frozen, just like I always am. Was he still crying? I want to be there for you now, and I'm sorry I've been too much of a coward to break your door down or climb through your window or some other completely ridiculous idea, but I don't... He felt a sob begin to build in his throat before pushing it back down. I don't think you would have appreciated that. He almost laughed at his own joke, and somehow the little twitch of his lips upward made everything else inside him come crashing down. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? He had absolutely no idea. He had no clue how to make this better. He had no idea how to help. Some hero he was. He didn't think he'd ever cried so hard in his life. He was trembling from head to toe, and he had to physically stop himself from vomiting up whatever was left in his stomach. His sight was completely obscured by tears, and even then he had his face in his arm, resting on his knees, just trying to shut himself out from the world as he cried his eyes out and clutched at his chest because it just hurt that much. He felt sobs rip through his throat like knives, and they stung, but it was nothing compared to the overwhelming agony of his heart shattering into a million pieces. That's why he didn't hear the door open. He only knew when strong arms suddenly wrapped around him. He should have frozen. He should have said something, said something meaningful or beautiful or just a plain old thank you. He should have stopped crying and comforted his boyfriend like he had been wanting to for so long, like he had been begging to. But no, he didn't do that. He just latched onto him and cried even harder. I'm all right, see? Fuck. Kotsky shook his head like he was clearing it before speaking softer than Kirishim had ever heard him before. It's going to be fine. I'm right here, okay? I'm right here. This would have been a good time to comfort him, to switch their roles. Instead, Kirishim had just buried his face in his neck and tried his best to steady his breathing. Okay, he whispered, barely audible over his own sobs. And then Kotsky just sat there. As Kirishima clung to him, he didn't protest, didn't say, okay, that's enough, get off. Didn't complain about the tears soaking through his shirt or how much it must have hurt when Kirishima held him as tight as possible. He even ran his fingers through his hair awkwardly, like he was doing his best to be affectionate when he had never really learned how. And that thought was like rubbing salt in an already burning wound. Sorry I'm such a mess, Kirishima finally said, leaning back to rub at his eyes. I mean, you're the one that's hurting, and here I am like this. But you are hurting, Kotsky said, like it was the most obvious thing in the world. I hurt you. Kirishima looked up to see him looking away, eyes full of what looked like guilt and regret. You were just trying to protect yourself, he said with a half-hearted shrug. I'm not mad, it just hurt to know that I couldn't help you. And you say you won't be a good hero, Kotsky said with a little smirk. But no, the smile slipped from his face like it had never been there. You're too forgiving, okay? What I did was stupid and selfish. I think you had every right to be selfish, even if it was just for a little bit. Kotsky suspiciously wiped at his eyes before scowling. He sat up and turned so that he could sit right next to Kirishima and glare at the door, too. Whatever. Kirishima tilted his head slightly, like he could get a new angle on the problem if he looked at it differently. 
I still love you. He felt he needed to say it, not for himself, but because he had a feeling the boy in front of him might have been doubting it. I don't think you're weak. You could have stayed in there for another month and I wouldn't have been mad. I'd have still loved you then, too. I love you, too, but can we talk about something else? Kotsky breathed. I can't do this right now. Kirishima's heart sank a little lower than it already was. Of course. What do you want to talk about? Have you guys, uh... He huffed lightly and ran his fingers through his hair. You guys watched any good movies lately? Kirishima smiled sadly to himself. No, we haven't had a movie night since... Well, that's fucking dumb. He turned to see the boy scowling at the ground. Why wouldn't you? Because we were worried about you, Kirishima said automatically. We couldn't bring ourselves to spend time together without you like that. We agreed to wait until you were ready to come back. Well, that's never going to happen. You learn anything this past week worth my time? And so they sat there, talking idly and softly like nothing was amiss, like there wasn't a heavy tension still in the air pressing down on them from all sides. Kirishima leaned over so that their shoulders met and put his head on his shoulder. In response, Kotsky had grabbed his hand and laced their fingers together and held tightly. They still kept talking, but a bit of the tension drained from them at the touch. Maybe that was why Kotsky said what he did next. After Kirishima had accidentally let slip about how everyone else missed him. So, if I agree to go to your stupid movie night, I pick who goes? Never gonna happen, huh? He felt a shaky grin spread across his face. Of course. All our stupid friends can go. Kotsky ran his fingers through his hair once more and huffed. Yeah, that's it. That's totally fine, he said quickly. We won't have anyone there that you don't want. And no fucking cry circle. Kirishima turned his head slightly, confused as he stared up at the other's face. No what now? No fucking cry circle, he said again with a look of disgust. That stupid thing everyone's been doing whenever everybody sits in a circle and they cry. You mean talking through our issues and supporting each other, Kirishima said with a smile. Of course he had come up with a silly little name for what they had been doing. Under all his bite, he was just a huge dork, no matter how hard he tried to deny it. Whatever. No emotions of any kind. And I'm not a fucking dork. Kirishima couldn't help but bark out a strangled laugh. He must have said some of that out loud. All right, all right. We'll do our best. He clicked his tongue and turned away. And no questions. I mean it. Well, he said, thinking about their friends and how overwhelmingly worried they were, how much sleep they'd lost and how they'd eaten. We'll do our best. As soon as he made sure Kotsky was okay, and that no, he wasn't going to disappear back into his room the moment he left, and no, he wasn't going to have a mental breakdown as soon as he left either, Kirishima had to run down to the common room where everyone was just getting back from class to tell them about the movie night. They were all obviously relieved that Kotsky was finally talking to someone and that he was willing to start spending time outside his room again. Many were, pe were just clearly upset that they wouldn't be able to go, but Kirishima knew that they understood it was for the best. They couldn't overwhelm him, especially if they were going to follow his no-emotions guideline. Midoriya was by far the most upset to not be included, that was for sure. He could see that the boy was trying to be considerate of Kotsky's wishes, but it was clearly hard for him. Kirishima couldn't hardly blame him. He had known the blonde the longest, yet he had no idea what was going on behind closed doors the entire time. Knowing him, guilt was probably eating him alive, even if it wasn't his fault in the slightest. The Baku squad, however, was ecstatic and near tears. Mina went off on a mission with Kaminari to pick out the best possible movies, and Shinso, Jiro, and Saro all headed off to the kitchen to try and make something worthy of Katsuki Bakugo's taste buds, and were probably failing miserably. Okay, I have these for if he wants to watch horror, or these if he wants to watch a superhero movie. What about this one? He loves classic All Might films. No, guys, I think you're supposed to add the eggs and then the flour. Maybe we should just ask Sado for help. Damn it, Shinso, I am not admitting defeat here. Kirishima shook his head at his friends and their antics. Hopefully it would all be fine and nothing would blow up in their faces. Hopefully nothing worse would come out of Kotsky's mouth tonight. Not because he didn't want to feel worse, but because that would mean that his past was just that much darker. He and Kotsky came out of the elevator to see all their friends standing in a circle, whispering amongst each other hurriedly. Then they caught sight of the two of them and froze. Kirishima looked between Kotsky and the group, feeling the tension slowly start to build. He awkwardly waved and forced himself to smile, hoping to dispel some of it. Hey, guys. Nobody moved for a second, and then... Blasty! Mina yelled, running up to him with a shaky yet genuine smile. She stopped right as she reached him, though, like she was afraid to get closer. 
Can I, uh, hug you? You've never asked before, raccoon eyes, Koski grumbled. Her smile fell, and now there was nothing masking how much she probably wanted to cry. I mean, uh, I guess, I'm sorry, I just don't want to make you uncomfortable. Fucking hell, he said with an eye roll. Just treat me like you always do, moron. I said I don't want any emotional bullshit. Oh, uh, right. She was still cautious as she approached him, like he might flinch away at the last second. The hug she gave eventually was not like their usual ones. It was typically her trying to be as obnoxious as possible while the blonde complained the whole time. But now she wrapped her arms around him delicately yet tightly and rested her head on his chest so that the top of it was tucked beneath his chin. Koski patted her on the back awkwardly, like he wasn't entirely sure of what to do, but he didn't say anything about just how long she was hugging him either. And for him, that was really a lot. Especially right now. Mina obviously knew that too, so when she pulled back, she offered him another shaky smile. Thanks, Blasty. Yeah, yeah, he said, crossing his arms with a huff. After that, everyone came up to him and said hi, skipping the how-are-you formalities entirely, for obvious reasons. They began to chat like nothing was wrong, not unlike how Kirishima and Katsuki had been earlier. Everyone, that was, except Saro. Kirishima looked up at the tape user, who was slightly off to the side of the group with a frown on his face. You good, man? Is no one gonna ask? They all immediately froze, most of all Katsuki. Kirishima sputtered for a moment. Hey, we all agreed. I'm not talking about that. No one said a word, clearly at a loss for what he was talking about. Saro huffed. All right, fine, I'm just going to say it. What was with not answering us? What the fuck were you thinking? He yelled, clearly pissed off. You had us all worried sick, man. Oh, so that's what this was about. Kirishi remembered how upset and regretful Katsuki had been for doing that and went to say something to defend him. I thought it was only going to be for a few days, Katsuki said with a scowl. I wanted to wait this damn thing out. And you thought that we would just, what, ignore you? Saro said, matching his glare. Not to worry about it if you were okay or taking care of yourself at all? I was fucking fine, idiots. He suddenly looked down and crossed his arms once more, like he wanted to make himself smaller, which was so different than he normally was that it broke Kirishima's heart all over again. I thought you'd just, I don't know, let it go, forget about it, if I was gone long enough. They all stared at him. Kirishima really needed to start some heart medication soon before there was nothing left. Maybe Aizawa could hook him up with something. Dude, Kaminari choked out after a moment. Even I wouldn't forget something like that. That somehow got a small smile out of Kotsky. Is someone going to yell at him? Ears? On it, she said, obviously doing her best to lighten the mood. She promptly smacked him over the back of the head. Love yourself, idiot. Kaminari laughed wetly as he rubbed where she had hit him. Right. Sorry. Let's just watch some damn movies, Kotsky said, obviously desperate for the topic to change. Kirishima pointedly ignored the slight moisture in the blonde's eyes as he was harshly blinking them away. What'd you guys pick out, anyway? Kotsky felt like there was ants crawling all over his skin, and he wanted to rip it all off. There was buzzing in his chest, too, like all the bugs are, were pouring from his lungs like it was their hive or nest or whatever. He loved all his stupid, moronic friends, and they were morons if their damn cooking earlier was anything to base it on. He really did. He didn't have to lie to himself anymore about that, because he found himself actually caring about others for once in his life. And maybe that just wasn't true. Once upon a time, he cared about his parents, and his teachers, and the other kids on the block. He cared for Izuku a long, long time ago, and was just now starting to again. Because then everything had started, and he didn't have to room, the room to care about anyone anymore. Maybe now that he was away from it all, and he was starting to have room again. So yeah, he cared as much as he hated to admit it out loud. Not that the stupid quirk cared about what he wanted, so now they all knew he cared. Disgusting. But now, because he cared, they all wanted to help him. They wanted to help talk to them, to let them support him or something. And he didn't know how to let them. He wasn't an open person. He wasn't like Izuku who wore his heart on his sleeve, or Kirishima who always showed that he cared for others in the best ways. He was an asshole, a few steps away from becoming a villain, and yeah, Aizawa said he wasn't one, and his mother said he was, and he absolutely wanted to throw every word that Hag said in one ear and out the other, pretty much like he did everything else in life to Spider. But why else would the League take him, the littlest traitor part of his brain had said? Why else would the school chain him up? Why else would All Might be powerless now? You think you could be a hero, brat? You'll just slip through the fucking cracks like every other low life that ends up in jail, 
You'll be lucky if UA doesn't expel you one week into the semester. Shut the fuck up, he had told the hag in his brain. Whatever. Damn it all. Why was he even thinking about all this again? He didn't fucking care what she thought. He didn't. It was all utter bullshit. He needed to get all his shit together and focus on the action movie that they had put on just for him because they cared about him for some unknown reason. Why would they ever care about him? He would never know. Why they would forgive him for what he had done, he wouldn't either. He was just a ticking time bomb waiting to explode in everyone's faces when they got too close. They weren't even halfway through the movie when he felt Mina slump over on his shoulder. He looked down at her and saw she was drooling slightly on his shirt. He took notice again of the massive bags under her eyes, almost as bad as Shinso's normally were. Even in sleep, her eyebrows were knit together like she was moderately displeased with something. She hasn't been sleeping, Kaminari whispered, looking down and fidgeting slightly with the pink hand by his lap. Her nightmares have been getting worse. And fuck, was, that was his fault, wasn't it? It didn't take a genius to work out that they must have been getting worse because of what he said, and now that he realized it, Kaminari had bags under his eyes, too. Everyone did. Have you been sleeping? He asked, because he needed to deflect. Then he realized that was a horrible deflecting statement. Stupid truth quirk. No, I've been too worried about you. Kaminari suddenly jolted, and he even woke up Mina in the process. No, I mean... Wait. I, I, well, I haven't been, but I didn't really sleep when I found out about Shinzo or Todoroki, either. Kami, Mina muttered into Kotsky's shirt, still half asleep. What? Oh, shit. Uh, Kaminari looked downright panicked now. I'm so sorry. Go back to sleep. You need to sleep, she said through a long, drawn-out yawn. That's not healthy. You both need sleep, Kotsky muttered. I don't want you having nightmares because of me. What? Mina asked, suddenly more awake. Why would you think that? The timing, he said, and damn it, shut up, shut up. You said your nightmares were about you not being able to do anything while people got hurt. Mina fully lifted her head to stare at him, open-mouthed. You remembered that. It's not my fault none of you can remember shit, he said defensively. Fuck, he wasn't supposed to care this much. This was getting emotional and he couldn't handle it. How weak of him. If you extra say one more word to me about trauma or mental health, I will go back to my room for another fucking week. Kaminari, who had his mouth open, snapped it shut faster than was probably possible by any human. Katsuki ignored the sinking feeling in his chest when the other blonde turned back to the movie and when Mina did as well. He didn't want them to ask anything. At all. He was relieved. So why was part of him disappointed? Was it because everyone else in his life had ignored his problems for as long as he could remember, and now he was just forcing them to do the same? Was it so horrible that he wondered to get help? To have feelings that weren't rage or indifference or despair? Was it so horrible to not be strong for once? Because he had to be strong. He had to prove everyone wrong, prove her wrong, that he could do it, that he wasn't a fucking villain of all things. Just because he was rude and loud to everyone he didn't understand the motivations of, did that make him irredeemable? Was not knowing who was on his side because everyone seemed to always be against him such a heinous crime? Hey, be nice, Kirishima muttered on his other side, ripping Koski from his thoughts. They just want you to know it's not your fault. Whatever, shitty hair, he said, and then, completely and totally fucking against his will, he would claim that to his grave, because there was absolutely no way he wanted to say this shit. Does it help? His voice was so quiet, and wow, it was weird being quiet. He had been trying his best to do that recently, after a particularly annoying chapter in that stupid fucking book that Aizawa gave him. That he would be surprised if Kirishima even heard him at all. But he did. Does what help? He said, somewhat absentmindedly, still watching the movie. Talking. About your shitty feelings. He felt Kirishima freeze more than he saw it. He was vaguely aware of everyone else freezing, too. Screw this emotional bullshit. Yeah, the redhead said breathlessly. It was like, like this weight got off my chest, and I could finally breathe again. A weight, huh? Kotsky could understand a weight on your chest. Sometimes it felt like he was carrying the entire goddamn world on his shoulders, and couldn't drop any of it without completely crushing him and everyone he cared about in the process. You too, mindfuck. Sparky? There was complete silence, as if everyone was holding their breath like they were afraid to set him off. I think talking with Aizawa helped me the most, Shinso said quietly. Kotsky looked over and didn't know what to think of the tears in the forever bored boy's eyes. But telling everyone really did help with that weight that Kirishima was talking about. I'd say so, too, 
Kaminari whispered so softly you would think that Mina was still asleep. I figured out how much you guys actually like me. A miracle, if you ask me. Kotsky felt his lips twitch. Moron. Love yourself. You're kind of sending me mixed me messages here, man. Fuck you. You can talk to us, Blasty, Mina said with a suspicious sniff. And why hadn't he stopped her from day one with that ridiculous nickname of hers? He had no idea. He very pointedly ignored the twinge in his heart at the word, though. We really do love you, you know. Did he, though? God damn it, motherfuck motherfucking son of a bitch. He wasn't actually considering this. You're the strongest person I know, Jiro said, and damn, he hadn't made this many people cry since middle school. Nothing you could say is going to change that. If anything, it's going to make me think you're even stronger. He let out another long, drawn-out string of curses in his head, or maybe even out loud, he wasn't too sure. All he knew was that he should stop. This was just going to get him hurt. He couldn't let himself remember all the shitty things that had happened to him, all the shitty things that he had done. "'You hold us all together, man,' Saro said. "'There's a reason we're called the Baku Squad. We're not going to abandon you when you need us the most.' Kirishima put a hand on his arm. Kotsky suddenly realized that he had put his head on his hands at some point. We love you. I love you. No matter what you choose to say or not say. The string of curses was getting increasingly louder and more convoluted at this point. He knew he was saying them out loud now, at least under his breath. He felt moisture hit his hands and, oh, fuck no, like hell he was crying after all this. He shot out of his seat like he'd been burned, most likely scaring Kirishima and Mina half to death on his way up, but he didn't care, because he had to move, because he was certain that if he sat still for one more second he was going to lose it. He began to pace back and forth in front of the TV, which was still playing, oddly enough, and as he did, he ignored the stares that practically drilled into the sides of his head. Fucking hell, he couldn't fucking do this. He couldn't turn against everything he'd ever known for a pack of idiots, could he? There was no way in hell that this would make him feel better, and all that other sappy crap. If anything, he agreed with Uraraka. He deserved to suffer. He didn't care how much it hurt his pride to admit it, but he had known it all along, deep down. He was the only one that agreed with her the only one that saw the truth in her words? Why the hell should they forgive him for what he had done? Why would they treat him like some sort of friend? But then he looked over and saw them all, just sitting there, quietly, when he knew for a damn fact that this truth quirk must have been working on overdrive in them. They were fighting it, just for him. Because they cared. And deep down he trusted them in a way he didn't trust nearly anyone else. The child in him was still there, deep down. Help me. Save me. Damn it. Damn all their fucking love and support. Damn it all to hell. Fuck, he spat, with an air of finality at the end of his rapid-fire curse pacing, stopping in front of the TV and ripping the cord from the wall because he was an extra bitch and he very well couldn't punch a hole through the screen without pissing the entire class off. Fucking fine, just... He groaned in frustration as he sat down across from the mall on the stupid coffee table and put his face in his hands. Fucking fine. Fine like... I'll do the fucking cry circle. He gripped tightly at his hair, and this was so fucking stupid. He didn't need to do any of this. But no actual crying, and if I'm going to do this shit, I need a few more people here. He heard nothing. He looked up and wasn't surprised in the slightest to see them all staring at him with wide eyes, like the sun itself. Y yeah, man. Sure, Kaminari said, standing up shakily with Mina. Who do you want us to get? Yep. Kotsky was going to regret this. And that was because not even a few moments later, after Kaminari left, Izuku Midoriya, in all his teary-eyed glory, came shooting out of the elevator at record speeds. Kanchan, are you okay? Kaminari just said that you were asking for me, and I knew that was absolutely crazy, but it's not like he could lie about it, right? So I knew something completely wrong must be happening, or that some sort of emergency was going on, or... Deku, for once in your life, shut your damn mouth. Izuku suddenly froze, as if noticing that no one was hurt or bleeding out on the floor. Wait... What's going on? Kotsky's going to talk to us, Kirishima said. They were the first words he had said since he made the decision, and his voice was tight, yet somehow happier than he had heard it in a long time. And he wanted you here. Well, when you put it like that, I just sound needy. Kachan? Izuku looked downright dumbfounded, and if he had, if anything made him feel guilty. He was the reason the nerd had such a hard time with self-esteem, and thought he hated him. Just sit down, Deku, he said through teeth that he was grinding so hard he was probably filing them down. Mina came out of the stairwell entrance not a moment later with stupid Icy Hot. Right behind her, and behind him, 
Hey, I didn't say to bring fucking round face. The girl in question flinched back at his words before becoming surprisingly sturdy. She stood her ground and looked him right in the eye as she spoke. I know. I was with Todoroki. I wanted to come talk to you myself. I can leave if you want me to. So that meant Mina had given them more explanation than Kaminari had, which made sense. The nerd had probably started chewing on the blonde's ear off as soon as he opened the door. He looked at the girl that he agreed with, that he knew was so much stronger than the people he gave her credit for, who had almost beaten him during the sports festival. He respected her enough, at least, to hear what she had to say. "'Is that everyone, Blasty?' Mina asked, slightly out of breath from taking the stairs. She had insisted, though, because it would be faster than waiting for Kaminari to get on and off the different floors. They really were morons, weren't they? Yeah, that's everyone. He glanced up at the two plus one that he hadn't specifically asked for. Because if he was going to do this, he was going to do it right. Because he was Baka Gokatsuki, and he didn't half-ass things. Roundface, you can stay if you want. You can all sit down or whatever. He hated this truth quirk. It made him sound so civil. It also made literally everyone else sound robotic, like Ida had possessed them or some stupid shit. They made no move to do so for a moment, though even Azuku, who had already been told to sit down, they were too busy staring at him like he was their newest lab rat. Or just stand there like a bunch of idiots. I don't really care. They finally moved then, coming to awkwardly sit on the couches. Of course, the nerd sat by his boyfriend with the gravity girl on his other side because they were all fucking nice to each other and tight-knit and accepting. How tooth-rottingly sweet. Then he realized they were all staring at him, where he had moved to sit with his legs crossed in the middle of the coffee table like he was the center of attention, like they expected him to talk, because he had said he would, didn't he? Fuck. I don't know what I'm doing, he said through gritted teeth, because he really didn't. This was all new and ridiculous. Everyone else just cried like babies or whatever, and that was it. I'm not doing that shit, and I don't want anyone hugging me, either. But I know you all want me to talk or whatever. Katsuki, you don't have to say anything you don't want to, Kirishima said, like that was actually true. Have you been living under a rock for the past month? Katsuki deadpanned. You know what I mean. <laughs> he scowled and looked back at the ground, knowing exactly what he meant, because these stupid extras cared about him and wanted to make sure he didn't forget it and because of the stupid truth quirk, he couldn't brush them off or tell them he suddenly hated them to get them off his back. So, Jiro said, clearly at a loss as to what to say. Kotsky was glad he wasn't the only hopeless one here. Are you okay with questions? Whatever, I guess, he said, and what? Did he not want them to ask questions? Oh, for fuck's sake. If you want to. The rest of them seemed just as shocked by his words as they did, but... That was one of the biggest problems with this stupid movie night, as he had said, them being able to ask him questions. It was why he had hidden his room all week, why he had tried so hard to hide the truth in the first place, why he was hiding his face now. Maybe he was just sick of hiding, sick of holding the fucking weight of the world. May I ask a question? Todoroki had asked, blank as ever. And okay, he could handle this one, right? After all, if there was anyone that wasn't going to pity him, it would be him and Shinso. I just said you could, Icy Hot. Why am I here? he asked, surprising him. I understand why you'd want Izuku here, but you said so yourself. I don't understand you. Kotsky couldn't help but internally wince as he spoke. Damn it, just jumping right into the hard stuff right off the bat. Yeah, about that. They were all looking at him with such patient eyes, like he was worthy of their time and effort. I wanted to... And wow, how much of an asshole was he that he couldn't get the words out with a literal truth quirk forcing his mouth open? I wanted to apologize. Or whatever. That actually made the boys usually stoic eyes widen slightly. For what? For what? There were a million and one things he could apologize for. So many ways he'd fucked up throughout his life. For saying all that stuff I did. And for once he was almost grateful for the quirk because there was no way he would have been able to say all of this without it. And he needed to. I shouldn't have compared us, and because the bastard liked you or whatever doesn't mean or make what you went through any better. Todoroki tilted his head like he was considering his words. Thank you for your apology, but I don't think you were all that wrong. If he had hated me, it probably would have been worse, at least when it came to his temper. That's not... Hotsky internally groaned. Why couldn't they just admit that he had fucked up? I'm not saying it matters how good or bad you had it. I shouldn't have said anything at all, even if we weren't all that similar. And why, oh, why did he have to tack that onto at the end of his sentence? It's okay, Todoroki said, shrugging. 
I pushed you, and I hadn't wanted to do that either. We both had our mouths forced open. He suddenly looked at him sadly, but there was no trace of pity in his eyes. And we're more similar than you think. My father never locked me in a closet, but he did once lock me in the training room and told me he wouldn't let me out until I passed out from exhaustion. Kotsky was not ready for the gut-wrenching emotions that came with that particular sentence, but he spoke it against his will. How long did that take? Around two days. I can't remember. He wouldn't let me sleep. He said it had to be me actually passing out. How long were you in the closet? Three days? Yeah, about that long. That's how many days I was suspended for. And maybe stupid Icy Hot's honesty made him weaker against this quirk, like he wasn't as scared to be vulnerable anymore. My mom put duct tape over my hands and stuff so I couldn't blast my way out without hurting myself more than she already had hurt me. Fucking son of a bitch. He felt horror start to creep into his veins as he realized everything he just said. This was the end of his dignity, that was for sure. Yeah, my dad put metal over the door so I couldn't burn my way out, even if I wasn't using my fire at that point. He only ever did that once, so it wasn't too bad. Okay, so maybe it wasn't that bad. If Todoroki was still respected for all of that, then they couldn't think he was that weak, right? It was only a few times she did that to me. It was whenever I was being too much of a brat or whatever. The first time was when I broke Deku's arm, though. That was the longest. Did they even feed you guys? Kirishima suddenly asked with a small voice. Kotsky had been avoiding looking at him, so he almost flinched when he saw the tears rolling down his boyfriend's face. And damn it, how bad of a boyfriend was he that he was making him cry so fucking much? He let me have water, Todoroki said, so I could go on for longer. I almost didn't drink it, I wanted out of there so bad. Silence met his statement, and Kotsky realized they were all waiting for his answer. And once he did, he couldn't stop himself. She didn't give me anything. He felt like his muscle fibers were going to snap from how tense they were. He could almost feel the phantom hunger pains from all those years ago. When she let me out, I almost passed out from dehydration when I finally stood back up, and the head injury that I had aggravated by smashing it into the door about a hundred times. He was absolutely not going to lift his head ever again. He was going to crawl into a hole and die. And why the hell did he agree to do this? This wasn't making this better. It was just making him want to rip all his hair out. But he had to do it. At least he had to do one thing. One thing he had known that he would have to do for so long and he had never had the strength to do because he was a goddamn weakling and maybe with this stupid quirk he can finally do it. But not yet because he was currently trying to keep himself from blowing all of them to kingdom come. Is that why she used the tape? Shinzo asked and Kotsky was once again reminded of how freakishly horrid his childhood had been and how eerily similar it was to his own. Yeah. He could do this for Shinzo, right? Give him some fucking solidarity, like it was over their favorite colors and not traumatic experiences. It wasn't as bad as, like, a muzzle, though, so. But you were muzzled, remember? Shinzo said, a dark edge creeping to his voice. By the people that were supposed to protect us. Oh, yeah. He had screamed about that earlier, hadn't he? Yeah, that was a whole clusterfuck of triggers, wasn't it? Stupid fucking teachers. Why didn't he put a giant sign above his head, listing all his weaknesses for the world to see? Oh, you should have seen Kirishima earlier, Kaminari said, a shaky yet genuine full grin was forming on his face. He went off. Kotsky's head whipped around to look at his boyfriend. He did what now? Oh, it was amazing, Mina said, eyes now shining with something other than tears. He totally cursed Midnight out, and then stormed out of the room like a badass. It wasn't much, Kirishima said, awkwardly rubbing the back of his neck. I just got so angry. Kotsky stared at him. I love you. The redhead looked surprised at his words for a moment before smiling softly at him. I love you too. That's about the love language I would expect from the two of you, Sarah said with a small laugh. I mean, she did almost kill me, so I think rage would be a damn good response. Everyone stared at him. What do you mean she almost killed you? Izuku asked, voice high and panicked. I thought I told you all about that, he said with a huff. My sweat contains nitroglycerin, which lowers my blood pressure. No one said anything which was wonderful since he had just told them his biggest fucking weakness. So, Kaminari said, why would that almost kill you? Oh, he forgot most people didn't know everything about nitroglycerin like he did, since it had been drilled into his brain by doctors since his quirk developed. Fast-acting sedatives lower your blood pressure, too, like Midnight's quirk. Recovery Girl had yelled at her. I think, since it was in my file and all that shit, and it had dropped dangerously low. If it had gone any lower, I'd probably be dead. 
He was staring at his nails, which were bitten down to the end, which had been a habit from childhood that he had dropped, but came back full force once he had been alone in his room with his thoughts. They were almost gone now, just like his dignity. "'Can I hug you?' Kirishima asked. His voice was so quiet he could barely hear him. "'I know you—you you said you don't want anyone to, but I just—' He paused to gain composure with a deep breath. "'Can I just hold you for a moment?' Did he dare look up at him? No, he didn't want any more guilt to hit him in the chest. He instead just nodded, hopefully conveying that yes, he could, and he almost even wanted him to. He was half expecting him to slam into him, but instead he was gentle, like Mina had been earlier. But he definitely held him tightly, like he was making sure that he was actually there, and not six feet under. "'I'm right here,' he said under his breath as he timidly hugged him back. "'I'm fine.' He didn't hug him for too long, because Kirishima was a damn angel that always knew when he was overwhelmed, and he gave him probably what was the biggest smile that he could at the moment before sitting back down, which wasn't really that big. Nobody really seemed to know what to say now that Kosky had admitted to almost facing death, because apparently that was the last straw with him, of all things. Maybe he could use this as a, a way to steer the conversation off from the pity fest that had been going on. Round face, why are you here? She jolted at his sudden question, like she had forgotten that she had asked to be here. She looked down like she was gathering all the different ways that she was going to yell at him to the forefront of her, her brain. I'm sorry. Wait, what? What? I'm sorry, she said again, her face then immediately crumpled, like she had been only keeping her composure through sheer willpower. I shouldn't have... Her words broke off with a sob. She was grasping Izuku's hand so tightly, both of their circulations were getting cut off. He wanted to bolt right out of the door when tears started to escape her eyes, like tiny waterfalls of guilt directed at his soul. What the hell are you sorry for? For saying all that stuff, she said clearly, heavily crying now, and damn it, this is what he wanted to avoid. And I felt bad enough about it before, but listening to you all talk about, about everything, I just... She buried her face in the nerd's shirt. I'm so, so sorry. Why? And apparently that was the wrong thing to say. What do you mean, why? She asked, somehow even more distraught than before, which was just perfect. I said so many horrible things. It wasn't my place to say any of it. And I never should have said that you had to suffer. But you were right, he said with a small shrug. Why didn't she understand any more? I did so many horrible things. It's not like the school was ever going to do anything. Just like you said, I deserved it. No one said a word. He stared down at the table and tried not to feel too disappointed. This was part where they realized that he was a lost cause, that he was nothing more than a villain, that he was weak for letting her do all that to him for deserving it at all. Kotsky Bakugo, you look at me right now. His head practically snapped up to see Izuku staring at him with the most intensity in his eyes that he'd ever seen before. And wow, the nerd still knew how to pronounce his name. Small victories. If you ever, ever say that about yourself again, I will personally kick your ass until you learn to forgive yourself. Do you understand me? I mean, not really, he said against his will. And, oh great, that just made Izuku start to cry again. His mouth still continued without his permission. I just let her do all that to me like some weakling. You're not a weakling, Todoroki said. He was rubbing his now almost sobbing boyfriend's back because Kotsky just couldn't interact with him without making him cry, now could he? Was I weak? for letting my father hurt me. That's different, he said immediately. He was the number two hero, for fuck's sake. The hag was just some weak old lady I could have blasted hell if I tried hard enough. That's not how abuse works, Bakugo, Jiro said. She was twirling her earphone jacks between her fingers, clearly distraught and yet looking at him dead in the face. He tried to ignore her tears as she spoke. You don't fight back just because you become stronger than them. They make you have a fear response that you can't control. And fuck, that was the first time the word abuse had been used, wasn't it? Made him feel disgusting, like he was damaged, like he wasn't whole. But you don't understand, Kosky said, trying not to sound like he was about to cry, because he wasn't. You don't understand how awful what I did was. Kachan, Izuku said, suddenly more sturdy than he had been not ten seconds ago. You weren't a, a monster. Sure, you were a bully, but so was everyone else. And you understand what you did was wrong, which was more... Than what they can say. And nobody deserves that, Mina said, arms wrapping around Kaminari's like it was bringing her some comfort or something. No matter what you did, you didn't deserve any of it. 
They weren't getting it. How hard was it to piece this together? You morons have it backwards. What do you mean? Shinso asked. He and Todoroki seemed to be almost as upset as the rest of them, which made no sense. How were we backwards? God, this wasn't going at all like he had wanted. He wanted to make them understand, but he knew once he did, everyone would hate him. What he did was so, so wrong. He knew it was wrong then, too, deep down. There was no excuse for it, but he was becoming weaker to this fucking quirk for no reason, so he wasn't able to stop himself. The hag just made me so angry, all the time, and I couldn't take it out on her. I lied to you all when I said it was just the adrenaline, that I had nowhere to put it. Mizuku was the first to understand, because of course he was. You took it out on me. His voice was small and disbelieving, like he couldn't believe Kotsky would ever do something so horrible, so disgusting as to continue the cycle of abuse in a way. I shouldn't have, he said, looking at the table and nodded him, because he didn't want to witness the end of all they had worked to rebuild together. You were just right there, stupid fucking five-year-old. Me saw everyone else picking on you. You, this quirkless little thing that I thought I was looking da- was looking down on me, and I thought it would be okay. I wouldn't get in trouble for it if no one else was. He almost laughed at how stupid he had been. But then she found out. It got so much worse, and I just thought that I'd get that much angrier, and still took it took it out on you because I didn't. He was absolutely horrified when a sob began to build in his throat. He pushed it so far fucking down, where it would never see the light of day, resting his head in his hands and his elbows on his knees. I didn't know what else to do. He stared at the table so hard that he wouldn't have been surprised if it cracked and opened the floor to swallow him whole. Now they all knew how much of a coward he was, how weak he had been, how much of a hero he really was. He vaguely saw someone standing in front of him. He almost expected them to hit him, to punch him straight across his face because of how shitty he'd been all along. He saw them fall to their knees. He saw a blur of green and belatedly realized there was stuff in his eyes obscuring his vision. Kachan, his voice was soft yet so obviously full of tears. Do you... Do you really hate yourself that much? Yeah, he practically choked out. I'm fucking horrible, aren't I? Izuku didn't say anything. Instead, he reached up and grabbed Kotsky's hand from his face and held it tightly. No, you're not. You were a victim, just like me. He tried to ignore just how hard he was squeezing his friend's hand, desperately trying to hide how much of his own was trembling. He hardly realized when a tear landed on both of their hands. He couldn't tell whose it was. That's no fucking excuse. It's not, but it's a reason. His throat was closing in on itself. His vision was practically gone. His chest was burning. Breathing was becoming harder and harder. I forgive you. And maybe he should have seen this coming when he had agreed to do something that he literally called the cry circle of all things because maybe everyone else was not that much of a crybaby if this was what it felt like. They were five and he was pushing him away, over and over and over. He forced himself to not care about this pure light in his life that cared so damn much about him. He beat him down, crushed his heart, made a million and one mistakes. He was fifteen, learning that he could rely on other people, learning that it was okay to not be strong sometimes. He was fifteen, learning that this light had considered ending his own life, learning he really did care so, so much, learning that maybe everything wasn't his fault, finding out that maybe it's never too late to rebuild something beautiful. Can I hug you, Kachan? The dam broke. He practically fell off the table and into Izuku's arms, where he couldn't tell which one of them was shaking harder from their sobs. He hadn't hugged them since they were so damn small, and he had completely forgotten how amazing his hugs really were. They both were practically holding on for dear life as they shook on the ground, numb to the rest of the world. I'm sorry he was saying into Izuku's shoulder between his tears, eyes shut tightly like that would help them to all go away. I'm so, so sorry. Izuku had a hand in his hair and was practically almost shushing him, which he really would have murdered him for on any other day, or at least that's what he told himself. It's okay, he whispered. It's okay. I love you so much. And maybe it would be okay. After all, the nerd was telling the truth. They'll hate you the hag had said in his mind. They'll never love a bratty villain like you. He felt himself smile. He really did do everything out to spite her, didn't he? Love you too, Izuku.
This concludes chapter 9, if, if we're being honest. The next chapter will be the last and final one in this fic. It'll be chapter 10. I hope you guys are enjoying this one so far. That was a really longer chapter. Um, but as always, thank you all so much for listening.